Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today we're going to talk about signal processing devices. So there's many, many, many types of uh, processing uh, units you can get. There's even multi-processing units where, that do all kinds of things that are very complicated. These days, it's not uncommon to have um, plugins for your computer program that do all kinds of things. It's like I said in the first video, it's never been cheaper to do this kind of thing at home. Now you really need to know how to use these things or you're going to do some real damage to your audio. One thing I always like to tell people is never record your audio with them. Just mix with them. So you're not going to record with any kind of, uh, well, sometimes you have to record with compression. We'll talk about that. But don't record with noise gates. Don't record with reverb. Don't record with heavy EQ. Because if you do that, you can't get rid of it. Once it's on there, once it's printed, digitally or in analog, it's there forever. So the best thing to do is do that post-production, so after you record. Now, sometimes you have to use compression when you're recording if the signals are too hot. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. So all these effects and processors that we're going to talk about, uh, they can be, like I said before, very complicated. And I'm going to give you a lot of tips today to save you a lot of trouble with all of them. One rule of thumb I always use and I always have in my audio engineering career is a little bit of this stuff goes a really long way. Please don't overdo it, especially in the case of equalization. Uh, you can ruin a recording with bad EQ, especially if your monitoring system isn't up to, up to snuff. You can really create you know, a bad recording. And trust me, a lot of my work is fixing things that other people have recorded in another studio. Uh, so I get some horrendous sounding recordings that are out of phase, bad EQ, over compressed. And at that point, there's really not that much I can do because it's on the original tracks because they printed it like that. But if it's not on the original tracks and it's raw audio, just microphones, preamps to the recording device, then you really have a lot of options. Um, so that's one rule to always remember. Just even mixing, just go easy on all that stuff. And if you're going to have your record mastered, then let the mastering engineer do something. I do a lot of mastering. If you maximize all your volumes, then there's nothing for the mastering engineer to work with. So if you're working on a project at home, you know, you're doing drums and some other things, and you're normalizing it, maxing it out, then there's nothing for uh, a mastering engineer to really do to fix it. It's already over compressed. So that's one thing to know as well. So the other thing I wanted to tell you is just to make sure uh, you use always the highest quality gear you can afford. And I know some of this stuff that I've been going over is really expensive and you're probably like, there's no way in hell. But I thought that too originally. And when I built my studio, I started simple and just kind of kept investing in equipment. And then I would get clients because I had such great equipment. I remember my first uh, really big jazz things that I recorded, you know, with Bradford Marcellus, and I went to New York, I recorded a bunch of stuff there, um, was because I owned some of these amazing microphones like, you know, uh, E49s, which uh, what the mic Coltrane used, and all the old tube mics that I showed you in that microphone video. And so that's how I got in the door, by having this equipment. And then I ended up engineering lots and lots of these, of, of these records. So, uh, just always strive for the best stuff. You're going to have low noise when you do it. It's not going to break. It's going to sound better. So it's better to spend a lot of money on a really good piece of gear than a little money, uh, you know, on something that's going to break in two years and just not sound good. Or it's better to buy one piece of gear that you're really going to use than buy a whole bunch of stuff that's not very good that you may hardly ever use. And I'm guilty of that too. I definitely have bought things that I don't use that much. So let's give you a short history of signal processing and then we'll go into the signal processors that we're going to talk about today. So in the early days of recording, all the devices we use today were non-existent. No digital devices, nothing. So a great example of this is if you listen to the recordings of the Beatles. Uh, they were incredible. The Beatles and the Beach Boys, if you listen to Pet Sounds, were the first bands to really produce, some people say overproduce, a record. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is a perfect example of this. 
they would do backwards tape stuff. They would create uh, flange with rocking the tape reels. They'd create all kinds of ways of doing reverb. They used the first plate reverbs. Uh, it just goes on and on. Those guys were unbelievably creative. And things we think of now, we'll hit one button and we'll get our reverb or our flange or, or our, you know, whatever other device. They had to work for hours to get those things. Uh, if they, you know, they had to re-record it on separate tape machines. And remember, back then, multi-track recording was limited to four tracks at first. And when the Beatles started, it wasn't even really used. And so, you know, later on, by the time they finished, they had eight tracks, and they would tie these machines together, these eight-track machines together. But then soon after that, we had 24 tracks, and then, you know, we put two of those together, we have 48 tracks, and now we have unlimited tracks that we can use uh, to create as much as we want. So we really have it good. Sometimes I think too good, so people don't really learn about audio like they should. So all these effects were created out of necessity uh, you know, John Lennon might say, I want my voice to sound like this. I want it to sound like it's underwater. Uh, George Martin, can you do that? And he'd be like, yes, I can do that. And then he would rely on Joff Emmerich and all these other great engineers, the trailblazers for all of us, really, to get these amazing effects. Now, the first reverb was actually a chamber located really far away from the control room. It might have been in the basement of of Abbey Road Studios or whatever studio EMI okay which became Abbey Road and what this is it's a giant box with a big piece of metal in there it's thick this thing weighs like 400 pounds and what the plate reverb is it's basically a speaker playing music or signal into this big piece of metal and then a microphone so as you play that the metal resonates and creates this plate that's what I call it a plate sound like a reverberation and that is mic'd, and that's run back to the control room. Sounds simple. It's pretty cool. And if you listen to any old Frank Sinatra uh, recordings um, at, at, that he did at A&R, that's the plate reverb that we're talking about. So that's, the, that's how signal processing came about. And now the original compressors were not necessarily used for recording uh, sessions. They were used for mastering. So the, uh, when they were making... Uh, vinyl cutting, you know, they did it on a lathe. Uh, what happened was if it was too loud, the signal was too loud, the drums were too loud, that would jump off and it would be gone. They'd have to start all over. So you would have to compress music to a dynamic level where, you know, the bass drum and the snare drum weren't causing problems with that lathe cutting, the vinyl cutting process. Uh, then it moved its way into the control room. Uh, most notably with the Beatles, uh, when they used tube compressors and they would use, they would become part of the console that they used. And they'd compress the vocals and they'd compress the drums. Then eventually digital effects units came into being uh, in the 80s were the first ones. Most notably, Lexicon's reverb units. There was a transition for a while there from you know, the late 70s into the 80s and into the 90s of the digital effects. And eventually there were digital interfaces in and out. Now, let's talk about equalizers. This is a big topic. There's lots of kinds of equalizers. They all serve the same purpose, pretty much. Tone control, all right? So you can really uh, change, to sculpt the tone, change it to how you want it. You can also use it to get rid of feedback in the live setting. Those of you who work in church, so your sound, I'm sure your sound guy has some kind of equalizer to get rid of the feedback. Uh, sort of FET filters, they can notch that and just get rid of any kind of humming or, or in the room or feedback in the room. So graphic equalizers are useful, but that's not normally what we use in the studio. What we use in the studio are parametric equalizers. So that's the kind of equalizer you want to get if you're going to use one in the studio. So if you think about the graphic EQ, it's set up to create a visual image of the frequencies. You can actually see it. You can create a curve on it with those sliders. All right. Uh, again, you know, mostly used now in live sound to correct speaker problems. I used to use one in my control room before I treated it right to uh, correct the inadequacies of my acoustics in there. And so I'd have that on my main speaker system. I don't anymore because I spent a ton of money and I rebuilt my control room uh, the right way and now it sounds great. 
But that's something you can do too if you have a bad listening environment. You can EQ your speakers. Uh, you could shoot the room, in other words, find out where the deficiencies are, analyze it with an audio analyzer, and then you can correct those with a graphic equalizer. Let's talk real quick about high pass and low pass filters. They're very important, especially for microphones. So a high pass filter is what it says. It lets the highs through and cuts the lows. Very common on microphones. That's very, very useful, especially if something's boomy. You can hit that high pass filter on your mixer or on your microphone when you're recording and get rid of the boom. Now remember, if you're recording that way, it's gone for good. The only way to add it back is to EQ it back in. So just be careful. But I always sort of run high pass filters Everything 40 um, hertz and below gets gone, unless I'm recording a live symphony orchestra with, you know, organ and bass drum, Gran Casa, then we want those. So I don't do it for live orchestra stuff. But in the studio, anything below 40 hertz, gone, all right? And not just cut, but just a curve shelved 12 dBs an octave down, all right, that you get with those. Now, a low pass is different. That'll cut the high frequencies, that's much less used. So if you have a lot of hiss or something, or you want to get rid of high-end noise, uh, they're normally not, low passes are normally not on microphones, but they are on consoles, and they are going to be in your DAW workstation. You can use that as a kind of primitive way of noise reduction. So you're not going to use that low pass filter uh, not that much. And normally it's from 10 kilohertz on up. So that's something to think about. When we talk about EQ, there's different uh, ways that we can shelve that EQ. So it can be a, a fall off the cliff shelf or it can be a gradual shelf. I prefer the gradual shelf, not the cut it right down the middle shelf. And you'll see that visualized again on your, on your DAW. There's another kind of EQ, the sweepable equalizer. You can tune in a specific frequency and continually boost or cut it like with the curve, and then you use your cue, that's what it's called, to sweep the frequency, and then you can notch it out. Now that is a primitive form of parametric equalizer. If you buy an EQ, you want to get a parametric equalizer. The great thing about it, it allows continuous adjustment of frequency. You can boost it, you can cut it, change the bandwidth, any range of a frequency. You can zero in on an annoying frequency and cut it or raise it if you need to. And the bandwidth control is what makes it a parametric EQ. So that's not something that's in any other EQ. Uh, what I use it for is I'll dial in a certain annoying frequency. Uh, and the curves can be ultra wide or they can be needle thin. So you can use have a big bell curve or you can have a razor sharp pin kind of curve and you can get rid of any kind of annoying frequency. So I usually use those kinds of EQs for cutting things rather than adding things. That's not a rule you have to follow. That's just how I do it. And these are called notch filters when you do that. Of course, we talked about the live feedback problem. That's the best remedy for a live feedback. It also controls hiss and hum. If you have 60 cycle hum on your recordings, you can get rid of that with a parametric EQ. OK, I'm back with one of my favorite compressors. This is an Empirical Labs Distressor. These have been around since um, the 2000s, early 2000s. And I probably got this one maybe in 2005 or 6. I can't remember exactly. It's a very simple unit. You see only four knobs, a couple switches. In the back, there's XLR connections and some other quarter inch connections. Now remember, if you're going to use an outboard piece of gear like this, an analog piece of gear, you're going to need D to A and A to D converters to get it in and out of your digital audio workstation. I'm sure some of you have those already, but just remember, it's not a digital piece of gear. All right, so we'll put this down for a second, and let's just talk about, let's talk a little about compression and um, when to use it. So the main thing that you have to remember about a compressor is it can be very destructive. So let's take an example. Um, if you get a drummer playing a lot of ghost notes, like in a funk setting, and the engineer doesn't really know the style of music or is used to recording really loud rock where there's no ghosting uh, or not too much ghosting going on and you know doesn't really have a, a sense of that kind of music he might or she might compress the drums really heavy like like their usual rock kind of session 
But then what happens is all those ghost notes get as loud as all the other notes, or almost as loud. And they're no longer ghost notes. Now they're loud notes. So basically you're taking the drummers playing away from them and making them sound like something they're not. So that's how a compressor can be really dangerous. So it's important that you as musicians and drummers are going to, who are going to be in recording situations know what's good compression and what's bad compression. So it's one of the most destructive devices for drummers that there is because everybody thinks drums need to be compressed. They think all drummers just bang really hard and they all play the same. And God forbid you do a jazz thing with a rock, a rock engineer who doesn't know any better. It'll be the worst day of your life. And I've been there. It's one of the reasons I started my own studio so I could cater to really great jazz musicians and record music like it should be heard. So uh, when you use a compressor, you got to be really mindful of what goes in and what goes out and how much of it. So let's go uh, over the basics of compression. Uh, in my opinion, it's the most useful of all the signal processors uh, that you can use. And think of a compressor as a type of automatic volume control. Uh, so we're taking a signal and we're squeezing it like this. And then we're taking that signal and we're bringing it up. That's all a compressor does, basically. It does a lot of other stuff as far as uh, character of tone, especially the really good ones. But that's the job of a compressor, is to compress the sound so you have control over it. It's a form of volume and gain control. Uh, so if you have a fluctuating volume situation, the compressor is used to control that volume. Let's say you have a gospel singer and he or she is singing really soft, and then all of a sudden they just go nuts. Well, you gotta have some sort of compressor, especially when you're recording, on that singer, because if they do that and they start really getting into it, you're gonna ruin that take with distortion, uh, especially the horrible digital distortion. It's not like analog distortion, uh, where you didn't know the singer was going to sing that loud. So that's a case where I always track with a compressor when there's a singer I don't know, or pretty much all singers I'll track with a really, really good compressor. So you can create, also use compressors to create audio effects like pumping and kind of a sucking sound, and that could be done in rhythm. That's a really important tool for a lot of rock engineers. So that's what a compressor does, and that's how it works. There's also something called a limiter. Now, a limiter is a compressor that's kind of on steroids. And it's not uncommon to find a limiter and a compressor in the same unit. Basically, I consider a limiter a compressor that's any more than 10 to 1 ratio. I'm going to talk more about ratios, but real quick, the ratio is what goes in and what comes out. So if you have 10 to 1, that means 10 dBs are going in, 10 dBs of sound, and one's coming out. Okay, so you're compressing it that much. That's a lot. So sometimes you use a brick wall limiter on the whole mix if you're recording live to make sure that nothing distorts. Okay, it hits that limiter. It's like an emergency fire escape uh, for audio. So a limiter is useful, but you don't normally use that for recording in the studio. Now, you might use it when you're mastering, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. So the whole purpose um, for using compression, like I said, is gain control. So let's talk about how that gain control is reached. So what we're going to do is uh, talk about each separate part or tool on that compressor. And then I'll bring this thing back over and show you how that particular one works. So first of all, you have a compression ratio like I was just talking about. Sometimes it's called slope in the old days. but it's, it's basically the ratio of the change in the input level to the change in the output level. That's all it is. So that you might see 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 and all the way up to get to 10 to 1. That's a limiter like we talked about. Or in this case on that machine, there's 20 to 1 and above and they call it nuke because I guess you, a nuclear weapon can get through. I don't know. It's pretty cute, but that's what they call it on that machine. So at 10 to 1, like we talked about, that basically becomes a limiter. Nothing's going to get through that. Now, a 2 to 1 ratio means every 2 dB, dB change in input level 
uh, the output level changes 1 dB, like we talked about. So the ratio can also have a, slate, uh, a shape to it, which is soft knee and hard knee. That's really useful, and I use it a lot. So a soft knee compression I normally use for low-level kinds of material, like jazz and acoustic music, uh, sometimes classical music, rarely, but sometimes. And it's very gentle and gradual, the ratio there. It tends to be more musical. Now, a hard knee is much more aggressive. I use that for rock, louder stuff, especially on drums. That will activate faster and it'll be more aggressive sounding. So there'll be more compression going on. The ratio will be more aggressive. And normally, uh, well, let me go over my ratios real quick so you have them. For jazz, I use 2 to 1 to 3 to 1. Uh, now, again, this is post-production, all right? I don't do it when I'm tracking. Especially for brushes, if I use compression on brushes, I'll do 2 to 1, 3 to 1 if I have a snare mic going. You never want to hear those brushes sound like your ear is right against the snare drum. I hate that. So overheads, I will not compress. Bass drum, if I do, 2 to 1, 3 to 1 max. Now for rock, I use a 4 to 1 or 5 to 1 compression. If it's a really heavy hitter or if I'm doing some metal or punk rock, which kind of thrash kind of sound, I might use an 8 to 1. Close, we're getting close to limiter now. So everything's just squeezed in. And those musicians like that sound because that's what they're used to hearing on all the records they buy. <laughs> all right? Everything's over compressed. So uh, that ratio is, I think, the most important part of the compressor. But try to use low ratios at first. All right? Now let's talk about the gain reduction, which works through that. So that's the number of dBs the level is reduced by the compressor. So some compressors call this a different thing. On that compressor, it's called input, all right? But most compressors, they would call it threshold. So on all compressors, you have the same thing, but they're called different things, which is confusing. So you're normally going to have a threshold, an attack, and a release, and then sometimes an input, which is normally the same as a threshold, and an output, which is almost always there. So you'll either have input or threshold, then release attack, those are always common, and then gain or output, all right? So hopefully your compressor will have a meter so you can see what's going in and what's going out. The idea is to use that gain control to make up for what went in and what went out. So you want to have unity gain, gain structure. You don't want to start adding a whole bunch of extra volume with that compressor. Now, if it's a really great transformer-based compressor, you might want to use a little bit output, uh, more output to get the character of that particular unit. Now these units are normally very, very expensive, $5,000 and up. I have a really great mastering compressor that's like that. And you want the sound of that compressor because it just sounds glorious. It's like big and fat, you know, warm, you know, sounding. Uh, so I use a little extra output to get that gain from that. But normally you just want to make up what you're putting in, uh, you know, and you're putting out, you want it to be unity. So you're not using a compressor as, you know, a gain adding device. You're using it as a gain control device. Again, it's called either input or threshold. And when the threshold's low, the input's low, that compressor does not activate at all or right away. It has to reach a certain threshold of volume to activate. So there's an attack and there's a release on most all compressors. Think of it as attack time. So that's how fast the compressor is going to react, in other words, reduce gain to the input signal. So attack times can range from like 0 0.15 to 10 milliseconds, depending on the compressor you have. 10 milliseconds is a lot, all right, for grabbing a signal. On some device, uh, devices, it's automatic. So there may not be an attack setting, especially on the old ones. Some of the really old two compressors, you didn't have to do anything. It just had one setting, and that was it. But most of them now will have a setting uh, from slow to fast. Now, for drums, I use kind of a medium attack ratio. I might use anything from three to six. All right. For rock drums, uh, I might go a little quicker if I want it to be really impactful. But remember, a lot of these can, things can take away impact from drums, too. 
So if you have too fast of an attack, you're not going to hear anything. The, dr the you got to hit the compressor. All right, so be really careful. You'll never want it on zero. So if you want to punch your sound, use a longer attack. Uh, that'll let the initial peak of that signal pass through the device. So that's important to remember. Now for release time, another important setting, this uh, sets how fast the signal returns to its, its initial level before it was compressed. So that can be normally adjusted maybe from 40 milliseconds to 2 or 3 seconds, which is eternity in audio. So bass type of sounds, you'll want to use a longer release time uh, so you don't distort the sound. Shorter release time work better for drums. So again, my release time probably matches my attack time normally from 3 to 6, 3 to 5, something like that. If you want a longer bass drum sound, you could set that a little longer. But for snare drums, I like to keep it pretty short. Uh, that's when the compressor is going to let go. So the release time is important because if you set it incorrectly, that's when you're going to get your breathing or pumping sound. Now that could be used as an effect, but you got to be careful. Uh, again, some units, old units, will have an automatic release uh, that's program dependent, does it for you. Uh, that's really cool and they sound great, but then again, you don't have control over that. Now, let's talk a little about noise gates because it's kind of like a compressor in a way. So you can think of a noise gate as like an automatic on-off switch for audio signals. That's how I think about it. So it works by reducing the gain of a signal when the input level falls below a predetermined threshold. So an example would be like if you have a noisy guitar amp, which is, you know, an old Fender twin that's giving you a lot of hum, you can set a gate so when the guitarist isn't playing, that gate closes. So it reaches a certain low volume, the gate closes, and then you don't hear the hum. And then it opens when he starts playing again. That's extremely useful. It's better than going in there and having to manually change everything or doing an automated mix. Now you can also use it on drums when you have tom ring uh, and you want to put a, a gate on the toms so when you're not playing the toms you don't hear the hum of you know sympathetic vibrations of those toms. That's incredibly useful too. Don't track with it though because you don't need to. Like a compressor you'll have control over the threshold with a gate, also the attack and the release. It's basically the same thing, but this time it's opening up with the threshold. And the threshold is what controls when it opens up. So let's talk about a delay unit. A delay can create a lot of useful effects. Uh, chorus, echo, doubling, flanging. Basically, you can use a digital delay to create all those things. Uh, and it, basically what it does, it records that input signal like a sampler, and then it plays it back after a preset delay time. Uh, and it can vary. That time can vary from one millisecond to a minute or more. Uh, modern digital delays you can set up to a minute and just record your whole self playing a loop and then play with it. So you always want to use one with a really high bandwidth. 16 to 20 kilohertz is great. Uh, and the lowest noise floor. Delay units are noisy as a rule. So especially if you hear the guitar player kick it in, you'll hear that, <laughs> that hissing. So it's basically a sampler on steroids, all right? So that's something you may or may not want to use as a drummer. Echo. So echo um, happens if you delay a signal by 50 milliseconds or more, then it becomes an echo. So, and then an echo will trail away. So that's, a delay is really an echo, uh, but that diminishes in volume. Now echoes, as we talked about in the first video of this series, it's a naturally occurring acoustic phenomena um, you know, if you go to the Grand Canyon, you'll hear some in there. Although the Grand Canyon is actually pretty dry. If you've ever been there, I was pretty shocked. But you'll hear echo if you yell, you know. Uh, if you yell echo, you'll hear echo, echo, echo. And it gets softer and softer and softer. So with a delay unit, you can make echo uh, by using the direct delay control to mix the, sig the original signal and then the delayed signal to produce that echo effect. So if you set a delay for about 100 milliseconds, and then mix the wet signal, which is the delay itself, more delay than the dry signal, which is the original signal, you'll get like uh, a the classic Elvis slapback, you know, da -da 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 -da, you know, that sound that you hear on those kinds of things. Rockabilly music is a perfect example of a slapback echo. That's how you get it. You can also do pretty cool doubling, and this sounds great on drums. Um, you can actually double two ways. 
You can double the drum part by physically playing it twice, or you can set a delay and double it with a really small delay, like 15 to 40 milliseconds. And then you're creating this doubling effect that can be thickening of the sound. It's pretty cool. Um, so it just, it just results in a really large kind of dominant sound. So you can experiment with that. The next effect you might be interested in is chorus. It's really popular. I use it a lot on vocals. It's kind of similar to doubling, but this time the signal is modulated, so the pitch is varied. Uh, and it's done by applying a little bit of detuning to the delayed signal. And it creates a kind of a thicker, wavy kind of sound. And it's used a lot on vocals and guitars. Uh, you can also create a stereo chorus, which is really cool if you're doing choirs, background vocals. I do that all the time. It doesn't sound great on drums. Maybe you want to try it on your cymbals. Uh, it's a cool effect, though. So that's something that you can try to use. We did in the first video talk about flanging. So I'll talk a little about that in depth because it has been used on some rock records. So it's a pretty interesting effect. It's, it's very colored. It's a filter tone. It, it sweeps through the spectrum with phase, okay? So it's like I know that was a poor recreation, but that's what it, it does. And it's created with a very short delay, 20 milliseconds normally, combined with the direct signal. So the two are basically undistinguishable between each other. And that creates a phase cancellation, all right? And it has peaks and dips in that phase uh, cancellation, so it's moving. And you're sweeping it, so it sweeps with the delay time from like 0 to 20 milliseconds automatically. That's how it works. So you're not turning a knob unless you want to. That's the effect. And you can set the effect to the speed that you want, the swishing effect. Uh, a great um, a great example of this is Cashmere, Led Zeppelin. Just listen to the drums. They're going through a flanger the whole time. Uh, at really, a lot of the instruments are. The vocal is as well, a little. And that's part of the char that became part of the character of that tune. If you heard that tune without that flanging, you'd be like, "What? What is this? Some cover band?" So that became part of. That's a perfect example of using flanging on drums in a really innovative way and it just became part of that and every time I hear cashmere I always say to myself god that's so great you know who thought of that that's awesome you want to have a reverberation unit so it simulates the sense of a room and hall acoustics that most studios are going to lack modern reverb units are all digital and they'll use different algorithms to mimic the reflection patterns of real and imagined spaces you can create all kinds of effects with the digital reverb unit. Uh, you can use reverse reverb, like they used to use for running tape with tape backwards. Again, the Beatles did that. Gated reverb, like we talked about with Phil Collins, that cuts off at a controlled time after the initial note is hit. Uh, you know, I guess Robert Palmer used it too. Uh, actually, I remember a Paul Simon tune, Call Me Al. That was a great use of that gated reverb on the drums sounds really cool so call that up on spotify or somewhere and right away you'll hear those drum fills that's gated reverb then also on a reverb you can use pre-delay so you can create the sense of a larger space by setting a longer pre-delay so that delay will kick in after a certain amount of time and then uh, some reverbs will come on a console you get, like a lot of the Yamaha DM2000, 1000s will have reverb built in, or it'll be in your computer workstation. Those are all things that are common plugins, reverbs. But again, it's going to be important so you don't sound like you're playing in your little room. So one thing to do is you can record yourself dry. If you have a room that's reverberant and sounds bad, you can put a bunch of blankets and soft things around you, then record dry, and then add reverb after that. Uh, that's what I would suggest doing. And normally I do, I never track with reverb. I'll put it in the headphones for the musicians if they want it, but I'll add it after the fact in mix down because then I can add, ask the musicians what kind of reverb they want, what kind of environment. And it's not uncommon to have a whole record worth of stuff and every tune has a different kind of reverb vibe to it. All right. So those are some signal processors you're going to want to have. There's many, many more kinds of things that you can use. You know, uh, the sky's the limit. But these are the basic ones that are, are, have been really common with audio recording 
for the last 50 years. So I definitely re uh, recommend looking into those and getting you know one or two of each for your little studio when you record.